So I've been doing a lot of thinking lately about how Christians read the Bible, the assumptions that we bring to it, the presuppositions, the foundations that go unnoticed in our interpretation, in our way of applying what we read, our way of applying our worldview to what we read. The things that we carry with us into Bible reading that we don't pay any attention to, that we don't even know are there, kind of in the same way that we don't really even know that atmosphere is there, the oxygen is there, because we're so used to it. We live in it. You know, we don't notice it. So the gospel reading um, that I won't be talking much about in today's video is one that really intrigues me in this, because Jesus is talking about divorce. And he says that anybody who what he says is that divorce necessarily, by definition, leads to adultery. Um, not in the sense of one sin leading to another, but just because of the definition of what divorce is and of what marriage is. And he's very clear about this. And, and he's very... I have to squat down because there is... There is a, there's a pussy cat. Her name is Ruby Roo, and she's a lovely cat. Um, he's very clear that it, it, with, one, with one exception, divorce is not acceptable to him. And yet what's interesting to me about the way we read the Bible and use the Bible is that the, it's really obvious you live in American society right now you can hear the church it's quite audible to hear Christian people loudly saying that that law must be used to forbid abortion and law must be used to um, not allow access to marriage for same-sex couples very, it's very easy to hear Christians talk about those issues, which, by the way, Jesus does not mention. And yet this issue that Jesus mentions very clearly, divorce, I don't, I don't know when, if ever, I've heard a, an audible Christian voice saying that the law should prohibit divorce to all people. Even though Jesus is very clear about it, isn't that interesting how we, how we use the Bible, how we carry it into the world around us? And I'll bet you that most of us Christian people don't even think about the fact that as a group we've chosen these two issues and to focus on and chosen this other issue that Jesus is very clear about to completely ignore. What's up with the way we use the Bible? What's going on there? I'm not sure. Anyway, I have a cat to talk to, so I'll see you later. Good morning. Father Sean here from um, still wet but still beautiful Shelton, Washington. Um, and on this day, I get to talk to you about the readings for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost in your B. Those readings are Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, Psalm 128, Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 11, and the gospel is from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 26. I'm going to be talking mostly about the Old Testament lesson from Genesis, um, but as always, I urge you to read them all. The Bible is worth reading. It's very worth reading. So a lot of the time when I preach at church, I am preaching, preaching, preaching. I am talking about the good news, proclaiming the good news. Repent for the kingdom of God is right at hand. Um, so that's the same good news that Jesus proclaimed. And I am preaching and proclaiming the the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified and him resurrected. 
sometimes I'm teaching, I'm explaining things to people because um, sometimes you just need to be taught so that you can have a foundation for understanding what's being preached. And sometimes I like to just talk about the Bible. Talking about the Bible is not preaching. Talking about the Bible isn't even necessarily teaching, although it can be. But I like to talk about the Bible because we Christians spend a lot of time with the Bible, reading it individually, reading it corporately, um, basing our beliefs and views on it as individual persons and also as groups um, on the Bible, on what it says about something. And yet, I'm the kind of person who wants to go back, 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 back as far as I can. I want to see the assumptions behind things. I want to see, well, if, if this is what we believe, then what must we have believed before that to get to this point? And then what must we have believed before that and before that? What must have been true in order to get us to that belief? And I like to, I like to take, take it back as far back as I can. I also like to go the other direction. If this is true, then what? And if this is true, then what? And where does that lead me? Where do I get to eventually? If I, if I claim that I have this belief, where does that take me? And where did it come from? Okay. What are the assumptions that I don't notice? What are the, what are the underlying foundational ideas that I have inherited from my culture, that I have inherited from my family, that I have formed myself by my own thinking? What is all of this that I bring to the Bible that I don't notice? Now, there are those who say, well, I don't do any of that. I just only read the Bible as it is. No, you don't. There's no such thing as that. There is no such thing as just the Bible. Because every time I read the Bible, it's me doing the reading. Okay? When you read the Bible, you're doing the reading. When I read the Bible, I am, among other things, um, there's a lot, of, there's a whole list of stuff I could, I could draw from, but I'm going to say I am a fairly well-educated 21st century American, okay? Those are three things about me that I could have picked from hundreds of things. I am not a fourth century uneducated Egyptian, let's say. The 21st century educated American brings a different set of assumptions about how the world works, a different set of knowledge about the world, a different cluster of foundational ideas that are unexamined than does a fourth century uneducated Egyptian. Now, those are not radically different people. They're both still human beings, but they have different ideas, different assumptions, different beliefs, different foundations that they don't know about, that they don't, aren't aware of, that they don't think about, they don't pay attention to. In the exact same way that we don't pay attention to the air we breathe. The fish presumably don't pay too much attention to the water they swim in. It's just there. Um, a question to help make this clear is, what does oxygen smell like? You have no idea what oxygen smells like, do you? You have no clue. I have read that scientists speculate, some scientists who have thought about this, speculate that oxygen is probably very bitter. Um, but I don't know. Do you know why I don't know? It's because I've been smelling oxygen my entire life. Literally, from the moment I was born, I started smelling oxygen. Maybe if I could go back to, to that stage in my life, maybe I could recognize what it smells like. But now I, it's so much a part of me, I can't do without it. I don't know. I don't, I don't recognize that smell. Every, it's the background that I can't, I can't be aware of. Just like the assumptions that are in my head, just like the cultural assumptions that I bring with me, just like all of those foundational ideas. So anyway, here's the point. When we read the Bible, it's not just the Bible. It's me reading the Bible. It's my group reading the Bible. It's whatever, reading the Bible. And here's an interesting thing. So in Genesis, 
Um, the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper to fit, fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, More often than not, the unspoken, unhidden, uh, un, unnoticed assumption that I see brought to this passage is that this passage is designed to teach us who it's okay to have sex with and designed to teach us that the point of marriage is procreation. Man and woman, that's for making babies, right? But the thing that that assumption, that that must be the answer, that must be the question that this passage is designed to answer, the problem with that assumption is it blinds us to what the chapter, is, the passage, is actually saying. Now listen to this. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and he's talking about cattle and the birds of the air and beasts of the field, and he brings all of those creatures, all of those moo cows and those, those um, buffaloes and presumably those hippopotamuses and hummingbirds and eagles and little chipmunks and all those creatures. He brings all those creatures to Adam, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So what God is trying to do here is to solve the problem of Adam's loneliness. All right? He's not trying to get the world populated. He's trying to solve the problem of Adam being lonely. Because if this passage were about having sex and making babies then what that means is God is bringing the moo cows and the buffaloes and the hummingbirds and the eagles to Adam to see if Adam wants to have sex with him and make babies. That's what the passage is about. If it's about making babies. But it says, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. If... If a cow was a possible, could in any conceivable world have been an answer to the problem that God saw, then we know that the problem isn't mating. The problem is companionship, the need for companionship. The need for, well, what we're going to call love. And that means that God thought that a cow might do it. A cat might be the solution. A hummingbird, maybe, maybe that's what Adam needs. And it wasn't until Adam said in some way, nope, this is not, this is not going to do it. This isn't what I'm looking for. None of these beautiful cows and hummingbirds and not even the, not even the ocelots and the bears and the wolves and the beautiful foxes. None of those solve my need, God. Thanks for trying, but none of them do it. Then Adam, Adam got put to sleep and God brought that rib out of him and made woman and said, okay, that does it. That gives me the companionship that I need. Our assumption that we don't notice is that this must be ultimately about sex. But what we don't notice is that that means that God by implication, is trying to convince Adam to do it with cows.
That's preposterous. Yes, it is. So it's not about that. What's it about? It's about companionship. And the other thing that's really interesting that, again, we don't notice because we bring to this Bible the assumption that God is self-consciously um, all-knowledgeable and correct in everything. This passage says that God tried something and it didn't work. God tried to bring to Adam a companion, but it didn't work. It wasn't what he needed. It means that God was wrong. It means that God wasn't sure what the answer was. So God brought Adam, finally, a woman, and okay, that's the answer. But Adam was the one who decided, apparently, there was not a helper found fit for Adam. Well, that means that Adam is, Adam's response is what's deciding this, not God. Adam's response. Adam saw the beautiful cow and the and the lovely fox and the and the and the pileated hummingbird, no, the pileated woodpecker, and said, "Nope, that doesn't do it." Adam's soul didn't cry out. Yep, cow's what I need. No, Adam said, "Nope, that's not that's not it, God. That's not it. Nope, that one. Nope, not that one either. Nope, nope, nope." And God tried all kinds of different creatures. <laughs> You know there's a lot of creatures in the world, right? God apparently tried all of them, and Adam said, nope, 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 nope. Although I'm sure when he got to the cats and the dogs, he probably said, this is really close. But not quite. So Adam finally was presented with something that worked for him. But because we bring the assumption that this passage must be talking about who it's legitimate to have sex with. Because we bring that assumption, we don't notice the preposterousness of applying the that all the way out. We don't see how preposterous it would be to say, well, in that case, it means that God is suggesting that Adam and the cow have babies together. We also don't notice that Adam is the one who ultimately was saying yes or no. This creature of yours, God, does not satisfy my need for companionship. This one does. This one doesn't. We don't notice that. We don't notice that the individual person in this story, the individual human, Adam, is saying yes or no. And that that's okay with God. God doesn't seem to have a problem with that. God doesn't say, well, look, I made you this beautiful cow. You should be happy with it. God says, oh, no. Ooh, okay, I'll go. Um, what am I going to do next? I know. I've got an idea. It's talking about companionship, not talking about making babies in this particular passage. So then I, I'm, I'm left with a question. What if the individual person, not Adam in this case, but an, another different individual person, looking at the cows and the foxes and the hummingbirds and the pileated woodpeckers and all the others, and says, no, 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 that's not, that's not, that's not, no, that's not the one. And, um, and um, after looking at all the animals and creatures, says, this isn't really what I'm, I, I love them all, they're all beautiful, God, but this isn't what I need. And so God presents to him a, a woman, and this individual human says, she's beautiful, she's lovely, but no, she's not what I need. And so God presents to him Steve, and he says, yeah, that's what I need for companionship. That's what I need. That's what my soul is crying out for. That's what solves this particular problem for me. I want to tell you that logically, from this passage, I don't think you can come up to any other solution than to say, okay, for that person, it's Adam and Steve. And God's okay with that. Anyway. Um, yeah. If that passage is true, what does it mean? What does it imply? Think about it. Anyway. I love the Bible. <laughs>
I love the Bible. I love taking the Bible literally. I love looking at it for what it really is, not for what I think it ought to be, and seeing what's really there. And you know what? It's always disturbing. Always disturbing. The Bible always, when you let it speak in its own voice, always winds up saying things that um, I don't want to hear. Always. It always winds up saying things that we don't want to hear. Always. Um, yeah, the Bible's a pretty disturbing book when you let it speak for itself, when you notice the assumptions that you bring to it and account for them, and then allow the Bible to speak around past your assumptions, allow it to speak through your assumptions. When you allow the Bible to speak in spite of your assumptions, it says amazing things. It really does. So, just a thought. Leave comments. I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. And um, may God bless you and me as we together learn to deal with the Bible more honestly, more thoroughly, more accurately, as we learn to examine our assumptions and account for them, and as we learn to let God speak, not ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.